best-selling author of one of the most important highlighted historical books that's ever written in the sport of baseball. For 15 years, George was one of Nike's and Adidas's selected coaches for basketball. George was selected to travel to Asia to work with the Chinese women and men in basketball, going to eight different provinces. Now, when you understand we are all going to encounter challenges in life, if we can learn to compartmentalize those events and use self-mastery principles, we can accomplish anything. Good morning, everyone. Hey, I'm so excited to be here. I got my good friend, Buddy Thornton, on the line with me this morning, live and in person. And I'm so excited to for us to share the information that we want to share with you about uh, a subject matter that we've talked about before. Um, and that is Blacks in Baseball. It all derived from my own personal experience, as well as um, my coaching and watching my grandson play baseball throughout the years. And I just want to kind of bring to light some information that we all know, but sometimes we let it slip through the cracks and we don't stay on top of it so that we can, you know, bring some life to it, energy to it, to bring some resolve to it. So thank you for tuning in today and thank you for listening. And we look, I look forward to sharing the content, content with you, myself and Buddy. This podcast explores the significant issues of why Black children stop playing and stop dreaming about baseball. We're going to delve into the historical importance of baseball in the Black community and its contribution in the Black community with Black athletes and sports heritage. The podcast will discuss the decline of youth participation in baseball with the focus on the economy and, and access barriers that have hindered the, the, their involvement. It also is going to address the cultural shifts and the rise of other sports that Blacks are participating in, which have influenced the choices that Black athletes make because of the lack of representation in the sport. The podcast will all ha also highlight on the grassroots initiative program that aim to revitalize the interest of baseball among the Black youth and offer potential solutions to restore the dream of Black players playing baseball in their community. And in conclusion, we'll emphasize the, the need for active support and advocacy to ensure that Black children continue to dream and play baseball, fostering that, diver that diversity into the sport. And with that being said, I want to introduce my good friend, my 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 uh the editor of my book the black and white of baseball overcoming baseball and bias in life mr buddy thornton how you doing good morning buddy? george i i am so excited to be here i think that the topic is relevant um uh, in all of the pursuits that i have in my life i support the minority community and you know when you came to me to help you with your book uh I already had a fairly good historical perspective about the topic. And then I did some research to help you finish your book. And, you know, it's a sad thing. But again, I think that some of the talking points you have today will point out that some of these things, just based on the way the world works, we're eventually going to start to filter out into the reality that we have to face. There are some things we can do by focusing on uh, how we can overcome some of the natural things that have happened, as well as some of the sad things that have happened because of exactly what you talk about, the bias across the society. Yes, thank you. And I want to say, too, you know, we come to you with the information that we're going to share today with the hope of change, not the necessarily the hope of blame. Because I believe that in our honesty and our truth, as we have discussions, open discussions, change can take place. Is when our silence, when we're silenced, is when we limit our structure of change in society. So I hope everyone sees this podcast as a avenue and a gateway rather than a hindrance or a position of, of, of blame in this situation. So that is our intent. We hope that we get your support. And when I say support, I mean that we want to have you right into us. You know, contact us through our emails, um, through our social media sites, talk about the podcast, any question that you might have, anything that you feel like will be an enlightenment 
to the subject that we're going to be covering over the next few weeks, the next few months, and just help us segue this into a, a, a bigger social issue than it is now. So with that being said, let's explore the historical significance of Blacks in, ba in, in uh, baseball and in the Black community. And from my experience and what I've know, known about baseball from a historical perspective, I, Blacks didn't start playing baseball as a way of segregating themselves from the white community. It was developed because of being alienated from a sport for all of us to participate in together. So we wanted to, they had to have an avenue, or we had to have an avenue for us to participate in a game that we love and we are passionate about. And so the black baseball community started within itself. And so, buddy, what did you think about that? And, and how, what, what's been your experience that you've seen in this area? Well, you know, every sport generally starts with one or two innovators. And uh, when the uh, uh, old Negro League started, before they were, uh, segregation was, uh, 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 the barrier there was broken by Jackie Robinson. Uh, it was very important for the black community to see itself as, being uh, capable and uh, certainly deserving to play a sport that people loved. I mean, when you look at some of the historical names from the Negro Leagues, people that I think would have benefited from playing in baseball uh, in a multiracial situation in the from the beginning in the 1910s all the way to 1947 when Jackie Robinson broke through, uh, you know, I think baseball would have been enriched. I think baseball would have been, uh, uh, would have get, had a net gain, not had all the problems that it had. But we did have some things that happened in those time periods. We had World War II, one, we had the Great Depression, we had World War II. Uh, even the US Army didn't uh, desegregate until during World War II. And that was something that uh, woke up the nation. And when it woke up the nation, there were some very important people who decided, you know what, uh, if we can let any person fight for our country, for our freedom, then we need to open the doors. But of course, then it still took some innovators, right? You had to have an innovator that would break down that barrier. So when Branch Rickey worked with Jackie Robinson and brought him to the major leagues, uh, it was swimming upstream. He really had to fight a fight, but it wasn't as upstream as a lot of people want to make it. Because, first of all, the Negro Leagues had already proved that they had value. They had already proved that they could compete. And some of the, if you look at some of the records from that league, they would easily have competed with all of the white baseball players. Mm -hmm. So once Jackie Robinson was through the door, yes, in certain environments in the Deep South and, you know, some of the South Coastal states, he was still mistreated. He had to stay in other hotels away from the team. Uh, you know, there were still little things it, within society itself that he had to overcome. But the door was open, not because Branch Rickey thought it was time. The door was open because the Negro League spent decades proving that they were equal. And so the historic perspective was when we were allowed to look and see that it didn't matter about the color of your skin. If you could play, you needed to play. Then. Yeah. That was the beginning, but it didn't stay that way. And that's what we're going to talk about. Yeah. And that's an interesting point that you brought up about some of the, the historical players in the league, Satchel Paige, Josh Gibson, uh, Cool Papa, and, you know, some of those guys that we know of. And, and if you've ever visited, you know, for the listeners who have ever visited the uh, Negro League Museum and seen or the Hall of Fame Museum, uh, you, you will see these faces. And it was such a significant point when Major League Baseball decided it was time to integrate those players into the Hall of Fame and into what would be considered the White Hall of Fame. And from a majority perspective, it was a, a significant point in, in history and in time. And it gave relevance to those people that you named, buddy. And it was a, it was a great, great uh, moment in time for all of us. Uh, so I think... I think I have to agree with you, George, to a point. I think mm -hmm. the the inclusion has to be all inclusion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when the Hall of Fame decided to open up uh, a wing for the black players from the Negro League era, 
what it was, it was an acknowledgement that we failed them. Mm. Number one, that was an acknowledgement that we failed them and we needed to not do that. And, uh, you know, yes, there have been some periods where uh, there's been some uh, blowback, but at the end of the day, the broader society said, yes, enough is enough. Let's move forward. You know, we're a better people than that. Uh, sadly, even today, there are people who are not uh, really looking at it from an all inclusion standpoint. But at the end of the day, once that barrier came down, all of the barriers had to come down. And yes, I celebrated the day that they opened up the black wing because it meant that some of the people who deserve to be there may have gotten their due even after they had left us. Uh, yes. But it uplifted an entire group of people in the country. And how many acts can you do? How many acts do you see within your lifetime that uplift an entire group of people? Wow. How um, I couldn't say it any better myself, buddy. So now let's talk about the economic and, and access barrier into the game. Let's talk about a, a little bit of the impact of, of lack of resources or limited resources and how that's impacting youth baseball now. What is, what is your take on that, buddy? Well, you know, I grew up in a very small town in Texas and, uh, you know, the, the white farmers and the white ranchers and then some of the city people uh, were not the majority group. I mean, if you combine the oil field workers and you combine the farm workers and the Hispanics and the blacks, it was a fairly distributive mix. And so I grew up in an environment where I played with one league. So every player played. It didn't matter if they were Mexican, black, didn't matter where they came from, didn't matter what they looked like, everyone played. And you had to play based on your skill level, not who you were. And so I was isolated from that in that era. But then once I got into the broader uh, topic and I became an adult, I started to see some of the things that uh, I felt was pretty good about. I mean, in the in the 60s and the 70s, there were a lot of black professional baseball players, a lot. But then society started evolving. Some of the technology changed and some of the opportunity curves changed. Mm -hmm. And when you an opportunity curve changes, there's got to be a reason. Now, when I researched for your book, what I found was there were people in the sport who were not happy that some of the changes were made and it isolated uh, everybody from the same problem. The problem was that they want, there has to be a conduit to utilize your ability. Uh, all the kids who were the big fish in the little pond who did not ha have access to superior coaching, they might've been good, but they didn't get an opportunity to play with a superior coach. So they were not developed. And part of that economic curve is how many people does it take to play a game of baseball? Even if you're playing a sandlot game and you only got four or five players on a team, anybody can get a hit, just hit them where they ain't. Right. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's kind of the way it works. Right. Yes. So it, play a real game of baseball. You really needed 18 people. You had yes. to have, now think about society today. Think about society, even in the two thousands or maybe even the 1990s. How many ways could you get 18 people together to play baseball? Basketball had a decided advantage. There weren't a lot of black players in, in basketball until the late sixties. And then yes. when you started getting into the seventies, eighties, the basketball players who grew up in the environments where they got to play basketball on the playgrounds, on the, in the two on twos and the three on three leagues. And it wasn't about coaching at that point. It was about natural gifts. It was about, can I dominate the other guy? Mm -hmm. But in baseball, that's not the way it works in baseball. Even the most dominant player only hits 300. Right. So if you can't play on a team, and if you can't find a way to get a team together to play with, you're not going to be wanting to play baseball. And so another factor, the one small factor about the economics was that uh, because there were very huge deserts where we, uh, we call them now, we call them like digital deserts or food deserts or whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. There was talent deserts and the talent wasn't the players, George, the talent was the coaching. Yes. So if you didn't have qualified coaches, what did you do? Well, 
you know, a lot of the parents and a lot of the associations got together and they made these superstar leagues, these traveling leagues, but you had to be invited to play in those leagues and you had to have access to insurance yes. because the leagues couldn't exist and the players couldn't play without proper insurance. Correct. And I'm, I'm sorry, when you look at the economics and this curve from the 1960s, even to today in a lot of the areas where there are disadvantaged populations, picking up the check for that insurance so your kid could play a sport was a, uh, it was almost like a fine. So it's, <laughs> yeah, I'd love to have your kid on my team. Can you afford the insurance? Well, right. I'm sorry. I know he's a great player, but, and of course there were some instances based on bias where the associations actually put those barriers in place so they could isolate it to the more affluent players. Keep in mind, the economics meant that no matter how, how good you were, if you could not write a check, you could not play. The, and now yeah. you had this the association dictating, yes, I'm only going to take the top players, but only out of this very small pool of players. Yes. And it certainly impacted the Hispanic and the black players way more than the white players. Absolutely. I totally agree. But that, and this is why this conversation is so relative and so important. Because my experience was a little different from yours because I grew up in, in Memphis, Tennessee, where in our culture, there the first people I, that I ever played baseball with was all Blacks because the city was so segregated and so uh, uh, turmoil was so, tension was so high because of racism in the 60s and the 70s that we formed our own teams in our own neighborhoods. So my first experience, experience was just playing with all black kids. And then as we continued to play, the, there was a league form, which is in my book. Uh, it's called the WDIA League, which was formed by the WDIA radio station. And, you know, run by a man by the name of James Chambers, who was, I didn't even know the significance of this man, but he lived around the corner from me and I played sports with his son and his daughters every day and because they didn't make a big deal out who their father was we just knew him as mr chambers and so the league started and we would play and as i got really good in the game and in the sport i noticed that there started to be a shift in who was coming to watch the games and it was white coaches from what we would look at now as scout teams or club teams so one day i was approached by one of those individuals and he asked would i come out and try out and play with his team. Well, I'm like, okay, man, I was excited because, you know, hey, someone's paying attention to me other than a black coach, black community. I was like, okay, maybe here's an opportunity here. So I went home and told my father and mother, and they were like, okay, yeah, we'll take you out there. Where we practiced at was the local high schools or parks, and the fields weren't so good, so uh, taking well taken care of. Where, where I went for the tryout at to play with these kids, the other elite kids, it was at Rose College in Memphis, Tennessee, Midtown. So now I'm in a, I'm in an area that I had never been in before as far as other than passing through in a car and, and driving and seeing this immaculate field university up close in person. And when I got there, if you once you get a copy of my book, those of you in the audience, you'll get a chance to see what my experience was in that culture and in that situation. But everything that Buddy mentioned, it'll, it, it encompasses some, some issues that I had, some positives that I had in that moment as well. So uh, now I wanna shift over to the, the cultural shifts and, and diversity of the sport, which we're talking about now and how it's, it's impacting and, and what's happening right now in baseball. And so, buddy, give us give me some insight on your your experience with that at, at this moment. Well, all you really have to do again is isolate the sample. Take a look at uh, all the how great some of the players were in the '60s, '70s, and '80s, especially a lot of the black players. And you had like Frank Robertson moved into management. You had Dusty Baker moved into management, but there was not a steady stream of black players who either were given an opportunity or even wanted to be in management in baseball. Mm -hmm. Part of it was a positive economic stream. And that was because 
players were beginning beginning to have access to better endorsements. They yes. were able to make other money. Would you want to be a manager standing in a dugout in a sport in an area where you played, where you were actually out there in front of the crowd, and mm -hmm. now you're isolated to the dugout and an occasional trip onto the field? It's almost like I'm I'm done with the sport, except well, I can still be relevant, but why? Why? What was the draw? There were so many other social things that the black players could do, mm -hmm. especially since they could greatly impact the black community through endorsements and through making investments and doing other things. There was no draw to be in that vein. And mm -hmm. there were very few owners when they compared the black athletes to the white athletes and considered them for management Mm -hmm. They they were looking for someone that they could look in the mirror and see themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, there were some innovators. You know, Frank Robinson was a great baseball manager. I, you know, I loved his teams. Dusty Baker uh, stands head and shoulders above the rest yes. with his world championships. Yes. But, but when you look at it and then you start wondering, okay, why is there a decline of black uh, management in baseball, field management, not necessarily even above that, but there's no – black executive tree in baseball because the owners well you know it's a good old boy network plus it's also what owner doesn't bring his own team in to run a team right it's an organization it's a business mm -hmm. so if first of all if the black players aren't expressing a very direct interest and willing to set aside some of their own viewpoints about what do i want to do how do i want my image to be to the, the general public you know, there was no conduit that really matched. They didn't run stride for stride. And so we end up in a situation now in 2023 where Dusty Baker is retiring. Yes. And there will be no black managers in baseball. Exactly. Now, what does that look like for the, the black player who is 16 years old and he wants to become a pro? Not only does he not have a sufficient role model pool in the sport, but now – he doesn't even have a friendly face on the management side. 100% correct, buddy. And that's why we say representation matters in Absolutely. every sport, but especially in this sport where it's lacking representation from these executive offices down to the little league fields where these kids are trying to participate and play and find role models in all of those organizations to help them identify and see themselves moving upward in, in that manner. And, you know, your, your example of Dusty Baker, it's spot on. And so that's why, you know, when I look at the Little League World Series, we just had a Little League World Series championship and softball championship for the girls. How many black kids did you see on that Little League baseball team? Not one. How is it possible in 2023 that we have a community as broad as they pull those kids from to play this sport? And not just the team that won, that you can't find one black kid that's worthy enough to participate and be on that team. That makes no sense to me. That hurts the grassroots development and initiatives that, that MLB is putting into place with, uh, with uh, uh, Hank Aaron uh, events with, uh, uh, and some of the other MLB things that are being placed in perspective right now to help facilitate that uh, dream coming true and those accessible opportunities where communities can see us and see our children as viable people in that community. First of all, you know, take a look at the two things that have impacted it the most. Number one, we're, we're now a digital society. We're mm -hmm. no longer an outdoor society. The percentage of kids who actually even get off the couch and go out and try to play sports mm -hmm. has drastically reduced. Yes. You just don't you don't have a talent pool out there. Right. And there, there's a huge dichotomy where you have uh, complete, huge, vast amounts of territory, especially in the South, where you have a fairly large representation of black people in the community. Mm -hmm. But there is still a harbored segregation issue. Mm -hmm. So in the areas where you might have a fantastic talent pool, that's where you're facing the, the most harsh bias in, in the area. Now, 
go up to some of the northern states. Let's go. Let's let's look at Detroit, Michigan, as an example. Okay. The time that you can play baseball based on the weather and based on accessibility yes. is hugely diminished. Yes. You can play basketball in a gym. You can uh, practice doing anything. You can throw a baseball around, but you can't. You can't get out the sticks. You can't do what you got to do. So yes. it's really difficult to coach in an environment where you might even have a fairly significant minority population, mm -hmm. but they see a lot more opportunity in basketball. They see a lot of, a lot more opportunity in other economic areas. So the, the talent pool has diminished and the accessibility is why would I want to fight upstream in a sport where there's a very minimal representation when I can yeah. go over here and play a sport where there's a large amount of representation. So it is a psychological curve issue. And the once you get on a track where you have a diminished talent pool and you have diminished interest, what you're going to have is like what you describe in your book. You're going to have yeah. less players who are going to get the opportunity and the ones who do get an opportunity, are they the best players? Yes. Are, you know, it does. I mean, is it possible that the absolute best baseball players who could have came out of the black community are literally playing on the NBA teams instead? Yeah. You no, know? you're right. You're right. Because so, right here in our city and, and and MLB has done what I think is an admirable. It took, took an admirable shot at creating a institution or environment for kids to play. So they've created 10 MLB facilities based and built on bringing in minorities, building up the black community, introducing the game to them, providing professional coaches, guys that played the game, maybe still playing the game, invite old timers in that have been uh, Hall of Famers so that the kids can act, actually see them, touch them, have conversations with them. But when you go to the facilities, Who's actually using the facility? Well, I'm going to tell you right now. In Compton, California, the facility that's being used, even though it's in a black community, is suffering from what you just talked about, buddy. Those kids are playing baseball. I mean, football and basketball rather than baseball. So who's using the facility? A, a majority or a lot of Caucasian kids. And you can't stop them. You can't stop this from happening because you want to integrate the sport also. So, and you don't want to alienate people from who want to participate and stop them from participating. We'll be back in the same situation with Black people. But it's not effective what, what, what's happening. We got to find another way to bring the Black pool into those facilities to participate and starting at the lower levels engaging with the families and then grow it up from there. The funnel's got to be reversed rather than the big part being at the top. We got to start with that funnel base being at the top and bring it up to the cone. So now we get a broader base with the younger children, build that family structure in there and, and, and the significance that they play in that community, baseball community say, okay, now we got something. Let's hold on to them, show them that we matter, they matter. And it's, and it's for the development of the game and the sport for everybody. Why you should stay in the sport, not just play football and basketball. Well, and and then you also have their, the, the one dynamic that you and I, no matter how passionate we are about making sure it's an inclusive sport, when you think about how many levels you have to go through to get an opportunity to play at the major league level, it only takes one person with a chip on their shoulder, one person with a bias to close one door. And it, it, it changes one choice in that entire long thread of choices that a black family or a black child yes. has to make. And True. if that door is shut and they can't find a way around it, or they don't have an influential person, a role model and someone who have, has the influence to get that door back open, they're going to go to the easiest path. They're going to find something else they can do. And, yeah. you know, you're right. I've been to LA and I've seen some of the fields and, you know, compared to, I mean, I played on the dirt field when I was a kid. I mean, we, we were lucky to have a backstop, but we definitely <laughs> had a dirt field. And there was a home, a home run is if you could beat the ball to home plate, you, you had a home run. So, you know, I've been there, done that, but, <laughs> 
you know, even with the beautiful fields and some of the people who have donated money and made things happen, they cannot stop the dynamic that if just one door closes and a child or a family sees a better opportunity somewhere else, they're going to take it. Because that's the other part of that economic dynamic is now the even the black community has a very large palette of choices. Yes. And if, if they sure. if they feel resistance, they're going to go, ah, I can go do something else. Sure. I'm just not going to do this. So we have to nurture them. The word is not access. The word is in nurturing while yes. we give them access. Yes. And then you have to eliminate that closed door effect. Well, buddy, I think that that was well said and well spoken with that. We're going to bring the podcast to a close for this moment in time. But audience, I want to say thank you to Buddy. Buddy, can you tell us where the audience, where they can find you and what you got going on uh, right now? Because it won't be the last time that we're together. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, George, I always love spending time with you. Uh, you know, people can get a hold of me. Uh, they can find me on LinkedIn with my name, Buddy Thornton. Or they can get a hold of me with an email address, which is right on the screen. It's buddy, E-S-C-A pro at gmail.com. Uh, you know, uh, I, you can, I've got my phone number on LinkedIn. Uh, uh, you know, I answer all my calls. People, if I don't answer on the fo- first call, leave a voicemail. Tell me that you heard me on George's podcast and you'd really like to talk to me about how to help your community get beyond some of these uh, barriers, how to eliminate some of these uh, playing deserts for these players. Uh, But George, they can also get a hold of me through you. And, uh, you know, I think I think it's important to note that. Yes. Well, buddy, I want to thank you in audience. I want to thank you. Please, like I said in the beginning of the show, please email us, contact us by phone. Go through our social media, however you can. If you know of any sponsors that want to uh, contribute to uh, our journey and our path of providing bats, gloves, balls, equipment, uniforms to different individuals that cannot afford to pay those uh, uh, exorbitant costs with material that they need to play the game, please let us know. We'll make sure that uh, and any kids, if you know any kids that need those things, Please reach out to me and let us know, or, or buddy, and let us know. We'll do our best to hopefully become a blessing to those families and those kids. But more importantly, we need your voice. We need your, your consistent uh, education on the sport. And we'll be back with you again in next week. Have an opportunity to share a little bit more about uh, not just baseball, but other things as well. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you have a great day.